Can you, uh, how are we getting on there? Hello. Hello. There we are. Was it a technical issue? What did you do, not plug the mic in? No, um, I won't go there. It's happened loads of times before. <laughs> anyway, Tanya, great to see you and delighted to have you uh, speaking to us live here on our Zoom account. Uh, we're going to live from the bus, but I'm, I'm knocked out that you use Mullingar in the background. It must be very much in your heart. Oh, God, sure. it never leaves. I had to put Mullingar in the background. I Joe's here somewhere. <laughs> he is, yeah. Excellent. I can see him. <laughs> He's here. He's all around. This is actually our tour bus, so that would have been... Joe's seat there. Right oh, there. nice. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely, he just keep following us around. But uh, look, fantastic to be chatting to you. You have gone from strength to strength. You're very, very busy in America still. Where in America are you living? Well, so, well I actually live in Joshua Tree at the moment, but I've lived in Los Angeles for the past five years. The Joshua Tree is just down the road from Los Angeles. It's about two and a half hours, but I go between, I live between LA and Joshua Tree. Wow, so that's very cool to be living in the Joshua Tree and the album so proper, huge and all over the world, huh? Asher, I love it. It's a, I know everyone's always asking which Joshua Tree. I'm like, uh, there's tens of thousands of them, I don't know. <laughs> it's that one. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's one o'clock in, um, or one o'clock <laughs> in America now, is it? It's noon, it's just after 12. So you're eight hours ahead of me. Brilliant, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I remember meeting you, it was called, it's called Columbia Now. You were playing with a band. There was four lads in it and you were in the band and it was new to me because I never even knew that you were playing the bass. And there the you are. was just starting to grow at the time. There's an, an awful lot more of it. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, Columbia, it was called Bed, do you remember? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. That's a many moons ago. Oh my gosh, I was in so many bands in Mullingar. But yeah, I guess I was just kind of cutting my teeth back then and playing with all bunch of bands, local bands, wedding bands. And then we had a couple of original bands. And then I started doing a bunch of like TV work for the Late Late Show. And then I started doing like The Voice and all that stuff. And then I decided to take a leap of faith and come out to America right. and give it, give it a shot. And it was a good decision. I've been and flat then out. You, so when, how long are you in America now? I've uh, been living here permanently, well, semi-permanently, obviously touring, but for about six or seven years. And before that, I came out once or twice to do recording sessions in different places. And then I toured with the Riverdance and that brought me over here. And then I did European and Chinese tours with them too. And then, and then I moved here about six years ago. So you had you had inroads made and you had friends made uh, through all them tours that you had come over previous. Well, not in Los Angeles. I didn't know anyone in Los Angeles. I moved here on a whim and on my own with my base on my back. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I figured it was the best way, you know, yourself jump in the deep end. And sometimes it's better when you don't know people because it pushes you to to jump in. So I just started going to a bunch of music conventions and showing up at jam nights and and over time, you just get to know uh, the people who are kind of already doing what you're trying to achieve. So if you yeah. surround yourself with them. So, yeah, I just kind of cut my teeth that way. I jumped in, started doing jam nights. Then I, you know, started getting hired for bigger and bigger gigs through that and studios. And then the rest is history. <laughs> history is right because you have toured the world uh, sometimes on a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> And that's not even a joke. When I was with Dee Snyder, we literally used to tour the world on a weekend. We go from Germany to New York to second Sweden back to LA. It was insane. We did a lot of that transatlantic stuff with him. Dee Snyder is the man from Twisted Sister originally. He sure is. And is he still as good a singer? He's amazing. He's really he'll he'll always be my favorite tour. He's such a good guy. And he's so fun to play with because he still performs like he's such a badass and he's really fun to tour with because everybody thinks, you know, Twisted Sister and that kind of rock and roll legacy that he's going to be like this crazy guy. Not We do like yoga before the shows and eat veggies and then, you know, go out and annihilate the stage and then, you know, have an early night. He was fun because he's the perfect balance of rock and roll. He's a real performer. And he, I had such a blast. I toured with him for two years and I absolutely loved it. But as well as that, he's gone through the mill and came out the far side. Like he's 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 managed to stay alive as well, which is probably the the hardest thing to do in that scene. But you're you're very influenced by heavy metal, which is really the staple food of Mullingar at one stage. It was. That's where I started. We had severed. Do you remember? I don't know Ooh. if you remember 
severed. It was myself, my cousin, Justin McNabb's band. We actually recorded in your studio when we were like, I don't know, 16 or 17 on tape. <laughs> Before Mojo's was there, we were in the studio. Wow. Wayne Walsh was on drums and we set up his giant kit in the studio and we mic'd like, I don't know, he had like a 22 piece drum. It was so ridiculous. <laughs> but at the time of Mullingar, I mean, we had bands in the pub as well. Would you have remembered the heavy metal bands in the pub? Um, mm. Brian McQuaid was involved in organising some of them as well. Um, oh yeah, sure, I was probably in them. <laughs> I was just in all the bands, it's great crack. We had all the heavy, night, heavy metal nights in the stables as well. We used to do a lot of that and it was fun. And I used to set up the, the heavy metal nights for animal, for the rescue shelter and, you know, donate the money to the animal rescue shelter. It's like a metal night for animal welfare. Metal for, but look, apart from playing metal, I mean, you'd be a very accomplished bass player. You'd be probably very big into your jazz maybe as well. Um, whatever suits, I'd say you're well able to play it. Like you've played in many sessions all over. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. It's, it's um metal is like I ended up in a lot of metal bands and I do because I did work with Maynard Keenan and that kind of led me into that whole scene and but yeah I play a bunch of different styles I tour with pop bands a lot and R&B and I do stuff you know in, in most realms you have to so that's the whole point of being a freelance session player you have to kind of put any hat on you know <laughs> excellent Adapt. and your favorite bass then at the moment what's your favorite bass I played Sadowski basses. I've played them for years. They're incredible. They're a boutique builder from New York. They're like my family. They're nine pounds. So it's better than 12 pounds hanging around your neck. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And then do you remember Pat Hoy then that played with Joe's band going way back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. I remember. I remember seeing them all, sure. Yeah. It's great. And uh, like Pat would have been, a, he would have been the, the bass man. Like he would have been very influential, I'd say. And especially with Canny, who you bought your, your first oh, bass from. Now, Canny Gemi loaned me many basses. Rest in peace, Canny. He was a legend. And he gave me one of the best pieces of advice I always carry to this day. He always said, fuck the begrudgers. <laughs> I love that. Because, you know, when I was starting off and you're nervous and obviously, like, there's not many female players. And he yeah. used to always say, fuck the begrudgers to me. So I loved Canny dearly. And he was he was great for, like, when I couldn't afford a bass at the beginning, he used to loan me his basses. <laughs> I always remember coming home from gigs. So with my life, we ended up on the road and you understand being on the road. So fair enough, you say I live in L.A., but I don't really because I'm no. boom, boom, boom. No, I mean, we would mean that uh, we've been traveling the country ourselves, but uh, you'd still be in and out of the town. But you wouldn't. Monday was your weekend to us. So you yeah. didn't know what was going on in the town. So all this yeah. really passed me by as well. So but as I say, when you when you hit the road, you go into your own zone um totally but uh yeah canny was a a great one but the the pre-cbs base were you ever into them and uh i never had one but i saw them back in the day because i took up base late right like i was 17 18 i was just working in the rescue shelter for like 10 straight years and there was no sign of me becoming a musician right. and then i saw niall masterson play and i was like jesus that's class <laughs> I like that instrument yeah. and then I kind of got obsessed because I did the music course at Foss up on uh, what you call it what's that street Jesus I'm forgetting the street names and uh, yeah I know I just fell in love with bass because I had been the lads in an eight I was hanging around with them and Ross gave me drum lessons I thought I was going to be a drummer for a while right. Ross Kennedy was giving me a couple of lessons and then you know your poor parents had to put up with you banging drums <laughs> and me dad soundproofed the the, one of the rooms in the house with egg cartons and I did drums for a while <laughs> right <laughs> and then and then I switched to bass I saw Niall play and I just loved bass then I became really obsessed so I had a Gibson G and L first and then I had a couple of Yamahas and different basses that Canny loaned me and he gave me an upright stick for a while and then I played and then my first endorsement was Music Man I used the Ernie Ball ones when I toured with the Riverdance that was my first endorsement and then I played a Japanese company called Exotic. And then I always wanted Sadowski's. They're like the head honcho in the bass world. And then I got to know Roger the Builder over the years and we became like family and I've played his bass for years now. I have a bass story for you. Um, <laughs> so Adrian is the bass player in our family and then he of has CBS basses, but he had the Steinberger, I think it's called. Oh yeah, yeah. And my mother came to a gig one night and she's down the back, you know, and it was quite a sort of a, top gig you know and my mother says god above but all the bases that adrian has at home would he not bring one that w with a head on it she says 
<laughs> the old head. It's unfair that she had a bit of a point, right? <laughs> she definitely did. Yeah, it's a bit of style. It's, yeah, so that that was sort of one that just really stuck out. I'm just thinking of all the the base stories, and then uh, Jacob Astorius then was a. Uh, he was big in our house as well, you know. Oh, Jacko. Jacko was the man. Yeah, he was great. I'm like, actually good friends with Felix. His son is over here who plays just as incredibly as his dad. It's pretty astounding. God. So it's in the bloodline. <laughs> God above. What, what is that? Uh, so the story with your hair. What's the story with your hair? <laughs> well, it's currently in Mullingar. No, it's all mine. It's every bit of it's mine. And uh, so it's uh, your trademark at this stage. Yeah, I kind of, I got it actually when I was first leaving um, for traveling years yeah. ago. When I first came over, before I moved to the States, I went to Arizona to do a session out here with Maynard Keenan from Tool. And it was right before that that I decided I'll dread my hair because I thought, sure, that'll be a great on the road hairdo. And then it turned out that I wanted like perfect dread that involved a lot of maintenance and whatnot. So, right. um, and I just dedicated myself. I've had them now. I'm fading into the background here. I'm mulling out. Yeah, your <laughs> she has no hair now. She lost it. It's gone but, into Canton Casey's. But yeah, it's all mine. 12 years now. Fair play to you. Uh, right. So tell us now, you've gone all healthy and you're doing yoga and you're yeah. eating, you, you're not eating the beef anymore. I you, never did, Ray. Did you I not? was always, no, I've been a, a veggie vegan my whole life. I was four when I refused meat. So most people think it was because I moved to LA. It's like, I've always been vegan. <laughs> so uh, it's sort of an animal thing. I'm not going to eat them, yeah? Yeah, it was always, for me, it was ethics. But also then over the years, I got really into nutrition and plant-based health. And I studied that. And, you know, it's also for touring, like just such a clean way to eat and a clean way to, you know, to, to have your lifestyle. So, but I love it, yeah, but I've been my whole life. Believe it or not, I was always the, the veggie in Mullingar. I, I would, so being a vegetarian was that, I, I always thought about being a vegetarian that you could just, it was spuds and you could have beans with it. I, <laughs> I don't know if you follow me at all on Instagram, but it's way more than that. I'm the world's biggest foodie. So much I did a show about it. <laughs> I know, well, I'm, seeing, I'm coming up to that. But uh, to me, going back to all them years, like we, that's what, well, we'd be eating beans and, and, and uh, whatever. Oh, yeah. But, uh, so what did you start off on at, at the early ages? Well, I would have just said everything else, but so, you know, whatever, meat and spuds is very Irish. So I just have the spuds and cabbage and, and all the veggies on the side. I just never wanted meat. I couldn't. Sure, there was cows behind the field. I thought the field in our house, I thought they were all my pets. Hence why I wouldn't eat them. <laughs> beef, us, beef to the heel. Beef to the heel like a Mullingar heifer. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, tell us a little more about uh, Highway to Health. Where did the name come from and... Uh, your partner in crime, Derek Green from Sepultura. Yeah. Sepultura, yeah. Sepultura. So, yeah, I always wanted to do, I've always been such a big fan of like, you know, food and traveling and health and kind of environmentalism and eco innovations. I'm very deep in that world as well. And I work in, in a lot of that side of things. So, you know, myself and Derek have been friends for years and we were we were chatting. Actually, we were in Dublin one time, Sepultura were playing. I was on a layover and we were kind of hashing out this idea mm -hmm. of doing something together. And when we compared each other's pitches and ideas, we're like, it's very similar. Let's just join forces. Yeah. So we decided to co-host. So, yeah, so went out and um, my production team were from Dublin, my two best friends, John and Lucy, Irish production team. Um, so yeah, we did a big seed fund, raised, raised the money to get the, to get the trailer together and then started pitching it. And then we went out and we shot season one just before the pandemic. So we were all over the world. So myself and Derek co-host it and it's plant, it's all plant-based food, but it's also about like everything we do, like sustainability, we do activism stuff. We do like, we were with Ford Motors because they're doing the automotive, electric automotive side of things. Yeah. So we're covering a lot of different stories. And then we have a bunch of celebrity guests just for the shiny stuff on, on top. So it's been a blast. And you've met the happy pair. Oh, sure. I've known those lads for years. They're in our Irish episode. And so is Foxy. So is Fergal Fox. <laughs> yeah, of course he is. So I've been buying my veggies off Fox, my, Foxy my whole life. So I have to get Foxy. <laughs> Very, yeah, it's unbelievable. We're out in uh, Multi Farnham last night and uh, uh, we're out with Calum, Ka Calumica. Uh, Calumica is her name. And uh, she invited us out to, uh, she cooked. So we went live last night speaking and uh, talking about her cooking fish. And uh, she made a beautiful um, sort of a salad type of thing in rice and it was to die for. Nice. I'd, I'd be very much still a beef man, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and like for fish, when fish comes up, you go, oh, Jesus, no, I can't eat fish. Because years ago, you know, we had the fish at home with the, the sauce right. and oh. in the door and go, oh, no. Yeah, so anyway, no. we cooked fish last <laughs> night without any smell. And I get it. <laughs> There you go. You're branching out. I'm branching out. <laughs> we'll have to make you something vegan the next time at home. Really branch out. <laughs> well, you never know. I might go back to, um, might, go, might start on that. But it, we do eat a good range of different foods all right now. Oh, you have to, yeah. Yeah. Um, you met some famous people. Uh, Dave Grohl from uh, Nirvana. You played with him? Dave, yeah. Dave Grohl, Foo Fighters, all those heads. Lots of jam nights. I mean... LA, it's very funny out here because it's just normal. That's where everybody is. So it's not like, obviously, you're not seeking them out. But a lot of the jam nights we do. And uh, Dave, we just did Dime Bash, which is a tribute to Pantera before the um, before the pandemic happened. So that was all the guys from Pantera and Dave and a few of the other Foo Fighters. <laughs> and crack. Moby as well. Moby's a good friend. We work together in animal rights and stuff. He's awesome. He's on our show and I'm on his show. <laughs> So you're you're absolutely doing a bomb over there. I mean, everything is going very well for you. Yeah, I love it. I'm really happy over here. I really it made me stretch my my wings out big time and you know jump in all the right ponds. So I love it. I absolutely love it. It was one of the best moves ever. It's crazy. Like I mean, it's it's a tough city as well, but but I kind of I love this. I love the hustle of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's like meeting people. Um, no matter who you meet, if you're direct with them, look them in the eye chat to them properly no matter who they are they will take you for yeah. a hour straight away um, there's a lot to be said about just being a blunt irish woman out in the world <laughs> but it's not blunt but i mean you're you're straightforward like there's no yeah and i mean that's i, I think that works the whole way no matter where you are and if you're forward yeah. with yourself people don't see like if you go up and you meet someone famous going oh yeah uh, oh jesus from no. Mullingar, and they go <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm from Mullingar. I'll definitely never use that. <laughs> no, they love it, though. It's funny, though. Like, our, it really is, a, you know, we're known as the friendly bunch around the world. So, <laughs> Still, it's fantastic. So do you do you miss the days in the in the, playing in Mullingar? Ah, uh, sure. Look, I have the best of memories. I do miss it. Like, right now, I can't come home, which sucks. Yeah. Like, I actually, because I won't get back into the country the way immigration is. Oh. So, yeah, so it's a little bit of a weird time because usually I'd get home twice a year. And visit granny and see everybody you know um granny so is 93 that, now isn't she 92 i always she kills me i'm always adding a year to her no she's 92 she's <laughs> just her 92 or 93 she'll murder me <laughs> i added a year to her last year she got annoyed. and she's still on the bike she's not on the bike anymore but she's nope. still up and about so she did well up until the early 90s on that bike but but she's still i mean she's still sharp as a knife you know her she's a mad woman it's brilliant <laughs> absolutely um I, Another thing as well that you've taken on and we're talking about as I say, approaching people and if you look them straight in the eye instead of just sort of mopping down and scaring them or whatever, you're doing a lot of uh, public speaking as well. I do. I ended up in that realm as well. Yeah, I do leadership talks in the corporate world and health stuff. Away. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> it was just a bizarre progression of things. I kept getting asked into to speak at corporate events because quite often they want someone who's, you know, specialized or has an interest in be it health or they love in, in the corporate world, it's a different type of leadership when they see that you're able to juggle and balance a lot in your career. Mm -hmm. And they want you to kind of teach that to their teams. How because in my world as a freelancer, I'm in so many different bands that you're constantly dealing with endless personalities and different people. And I guess, yeah, they just saw something in that and they wanted me to like translate it into the corporate world. So I do, yeah, like presentations, and then I go into a lot of corporations and help them with like switching over to greener choices. In, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty wide and varied what I've been up to since I since I left uh, Canton Casey's there the last time. <laughs> Do you drink? Would, love, a little, yeah. I'm not, I've never been a heavy drinker. Like back in the day, we definitely we had our fair share of partying, but I I do, but I'd be like more of a sipper. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. Do this, I, you know, people are always laughing because they're like, "You're not the stereotypical Irish drinker." I'm like, "No, I'm." You can't when you're traveling this heavy and you know trying to stay healthy. I still enjoy. You know, whiskey or a glass of wine, but I, I've never been a, a heavy drinker. And the yoga, then, do you do yoga every day? Pretty much, yeah. It keeps me like I. It's just a habit I got into on the road because you can't. It's very hard when you're traveling every day, mm -hmm. and you're often just like on flights in hotel rooms, on tour buses, to find something you can do that doesn't need equipment. 
And that's when I originally got into it. So it's something I can just do myself for 10, 15 minutes or however long you have. And you, you're using your own body weight and it stretches you out. And I love it. So I do pretty much every day. Class. Uh, <laughs> plans. Uh, one more question as well. So how did this year go for you? Uh, did it work out fantastic this year and last year? Have things, have you been as busy or less busy or what doors opened in the last year and a half? I, it's been a brilliant year for me and a part of me feels bad always saying that but I really mm -hmm. just embraced the time in one place because yeah. before that I was on the road for about four years straight no joke like because yeah. I was jumping between bands so I'd be on the road at least nine if not ten months of the year for the past four years prior so this actually timing wise we finished filming season one in March I was in New York when all this started happening and we just come back from from Ireland actually and then, um, so we used the year to edit season one. So we did all of that. And then I developed another major project um, for the corporate side of things. And I was in studio a lot and I wrote a bunch of my own music to, to put into the, like um, to do these collaborations for different projects. So yeah. I had a great year. I had a really great year and I, like, it, don't get me wrong. It had its ups and downs and, you know, I can't come home and that sucks yeah. and all that stuff, but it's perspective, right? And you try and make the best of it. So all I things considered. Brilliant. And so all that your shows that you edit it down, wh what platform do you put them up on? Are they going on national TVs or where do you share them out? Where's so they're gone. It's literally just gone to market now. So it's with the sales agents. So hopefully all the major streamers. So we'll be able to, you know, it takes months though to shop it. So there you get a sales agent and then they go out and they shop it to the streamers, to the network. So hopefully one of the major streamers will be able to announce soon. I keep crossing my fingers, but I'm lost in the, in Mullingar. <laughs> um, so streamers, like who be the streamers? Is it on the internet or is it on? Uh... Oh, sorry, like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, all wow. those guys. Yeah, and then like syn global syndication. So it could be anything. You you don't know where it's going to land until people start like biting back. So it's it's a really tough industry, but everybody loves it and it's already shot. So we have a lot of content in a time where you know they need content. So and one of the episodes is Mullingar. <laughs> Of course, we shot all over Ireland, but we shot Mullingar. We had Derek in uh, at the statue and we had him in Granny's and we had him in Foxy's. It was very funny because a lot of the lads in Mullingar know Sepultura. So everyone was like, is that the guy from Sepultura walking around Mullingar? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. And look, um, what's the plans then for the, this year and, and next year? Have you plans in the pipeline? Yeah, so I have a lot of studio sessions coming up and then I also write all the music for the show. So all of the music that's in each episode is mostly mine and my friend's music. So doing that, um, which takes up a significant amount of time and the corporate stuff is starting to pick up and I'm starting to be booked for tours, but it's still a little like June, July, but that could be pushed. So we'll yeah. see. But, but yeah, either way, I'll be pretty busy with it all. So. And the music then you're writing, are you playing the bass on the music or are you playing other instruments or? I write it around bass. So I write I write the, the parts around bass because I'm such a bass purist. I didn't play guitar first and then right. go to bass. I was always a bass player. So generally I'll write it like it's a, it's a, it's a main riff or whatever or, or a whole song on bass. And then I'll, one of my best friends who I write with, my studio partner, I'll sort of tell him what I want on guitar or sounds or, or play a little bit on keys myself or whatever and build it. But it always comes from bass. It's built from bass. It's class. And uh, and as well as that, I mean, someone will say, geez, you can't play a tune on bass, but I mean, you can play a tune. First on again. Bass. And as well as that, you sang, there was a girl, I was watching some of your videos. You done a video, just bass and the girl singing. Oh yeah. 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 That was one of my old bands. Hail to Farewell. I loved doing that stuff. It was great. <laughs> Yeah. So look, uh, thank you very, very much. Much appreciated. Thank you for your time. And uh, so fun. It's, it's super, super to have you online. And it's great to know that someone Mullingar is thriving in the world. OK. Oh, flying the flag. We head into Canton Cases for a pint, do we? You can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you have a glass of whiskey, maybe. There you go. Be good for the vocal cords. <laughs> exactly. Look, Tanya, thank you very, very much. We will chat to you soon, hopefully. Or maybe we'll see you in Mullingar. Good luck. Hopefully. And, uh, Stay well and uh, stay thriving in the world of LA. Nice. Cheers, Ray. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.